Hello and welcome to our session today. I can see people are still joining the webinar. We'll just give everyone a moment or two to join us. So we'll start the main session in about 30 seconds, just allowing people to come through and join the webinar today. Welcome to the session this morning. I can see people are still joining, so we will allow just a little more time and begin the main session in a moment. A warm welcome to everyone who's already joined. As I say, just a moment more. Make sure everybody who wants to join the session has joined us live and we'll begin very shortly. Well, hello and welcome to this ITOA webinar on measuring sustainability in travel and tourism. I'm delighted to be joined by Caroline Bremner from our partners at Euromonitor. So a warm welcome to you, Caroline. Thank you, Rachel. Great to be here. And lovely to have you back because, of course, this is the second webinar we've run with Euromonitor since we secured our partnership. The last one was very interesting. So we're very much looking forward to your comments and insights today. And um, sustainability is a much discussed topic in our industry. And one of the key challenges being how we measure success and how can we see how well we're all doing in areas that we can improve. And there are a great number of initiatives out there um, thinking about this and tackling the subject. And I think one of the, the problems that we have is that there are so many elements to sustainability in the industry. And there's a tendency for them to carry different uh, weight and impact with different markets um, and with different destinations, that quantifying all of this is a really complex task. And uh, well, fortunately for us, Caroline and her colleagues at Euromonitor have done a lot of research into it, and she's going to present their latest sustainable travel index, which is a wide ranging study on the topic. And that uh, we look forward to hearing your insights in a moment. And um, just a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, Caroline's presentation will be available after the session. We'll email it to you and it will also be on our Insight Hub. And do please use the Q&A facility to ask questions as you think of them. Um, anything, just put them on there and we can raise them at uh, uh, an opportune moment and uh, we'll have time hopefully to cover some um, after Caroline's been speaking as well. So um, with that, I will hand over to you, Caroline. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so it's a, a great pleasure to present uh, this information uh, this morning. Um, it's from our Sustainable Travel Index. It's about measuring sustainability in travel and tourism. And first of all, I'll spend a little bit of time about uh, explaining the methodology, because that's absolutely fundamental to understanding the approach that we've taken. Uh, the, um, you know, how we've uh, worked together with our analytics team and obviously those very important sources uh, across the, the countries that we've looked at. Then we'll take a look at the high level uh, results, who's doing well, uh, who's moving up the, the rankings, and then we'll drill down into the individual pillars of the Sustainable Travel Index. So there are seven different pillars and we'll look at the results specifically with a focus on Europe. And then I have some consumer data to also share with you and uh, especially looking at consumers' willingness to pay for sustainable travel features. So let's get started with the, the methodology. Um, it's really important to say that Euromonitor is a global research company. We have 16 offices around the world. Uh, we work with a network of um, analysts that are on the ground uh, in uh, over 100 countries. And that's so, you know, 
vital to you know the quality and the robustness of the research that we have access to and that we can leverage. Um, as I mentioned, you know this is a, a very extensive piece of work that we uh, conduct with our analytics team. And essentially, we have worked together with our sustainability practice as well at Euromonitor. So previously, we had an environmental index which looked at around 99 countries. And then what I did with my colleague in the sustainability practice was um, pivot and you know, turn our attentions to travel and tourism. This was at the height of the global pandemic when clients and partners were coming to us and saying, you know, there's zero tourism. What do we do? How do we build back better? So with that in mind, we looked holistically across travel and tourism. Um, we divided it into seven different pillars. First of all, we have four pillars that have a weighting of 10% each in the index. Those are those broad level sustainability pillar, pillars of environmental, social and economic along with risk. And then we have more directly linked uh, pillars which relate more directly to travel and tourism, sustainable tourism demand, sustainable transport and sustainable lodging. We've worked with a variety of different partners, including the Travel Foundation to vet the methodology, to test it. And equally, we you know, leverage a lot of research across many different countries. So we have 99 countries, we have 56 different metrics that we look at. We have the analytics team that are building the index using their modeling, and their statistical techniques. And so it's a very kind of re robust process and we're updating on an annual basis. With that said though, you know, 56 metrics, it could be, you know, a lot more than that, but actually our analytics colleagues were saying, you know, the, that the more that you include, the less uh, impactful the results are. Um, also, this is not the only tool out there as we know, and it is just another tool in the toolbox. And of course, with any index, uh, you know, there, there is that, that question of what else can we put in here? So I would say, you know, obviously happy to talk more in detail about methodology, but, you know, with this framework in mind, uh, that's how we are going to look at the results today across these seven different pillars. So first of all, um, you know, if we look at the overall results, um, it's great news specifically for Europe. So we see that Europe leads the way in the sustainable travel transformation that we're seeing taking place across the world. So those lighter colored uh, countries in Europe are standing out. Europe dominates the top of the index, the first one to 17 places are European countries, and Sweden is at the top of the list. Other regions not performing so well, specifically um, Africa, Middle East, and also the likes of Asia Pacific. That's not to say, though, that they, there aren't areas where they are doing well. And I think that's what's so important about the index. We have 56 different metrics and so it's really important to take a holistic view and not just take a look at the high level results. But I just want to, uh, you know, lay these out and then we can dig more into the detail. So when it comes to sustainable transformation, um, as I said, we have Sweden at the top of the board. Um, they have uh, performed very well. They've moved up one place since uh, 2017. You know, we know that, uh, you know, sustainability is, the, is at the heart of their, you know, political and social uh, agenda. Uh, when it comes to travel and tourism, a really great mix of green and eco-chic travel experiences. We have, you know, the contrast of the, the cities 
with the Arctic, uh, some really great sort of authentic local experiences that you can undertake from foraging or Arctic adventures, the forests, the oyster safaris, the Northern Lights, you know, really lovely mix of uh, experiences and attractions. Um, but then it's also steeped in the importance of sustainability. So the Nature's Best Ecotourism Charter, they have a really, you know, strong uh, coverage of eco cities. There's 23 of them. And what really surprised me the most, you know, being based in the UK was just the sheer number of national parks that they have. So that was really very impressive. When it comes to who's performing the best uh, or moving up the, the rankings the most, we can see that Romania has uh, made very strong strides in the last you know, five or six years. Um, when I dug into the results, uh, there was very big improvement in the sustainable lodging pillar. So they'd seen, you know, really great results for, you know, reducing the level of energy used in hotels. Uh, they would managed to significantly reduce their carbon footprint. Um, also, they performed and saw great improvements in the economic sustainability pillar. So uh, greater levels of employment in travel and tourism that has helped boost their overall results. On the flip side, we can see that uh, Belgium has, uh, you know, dropped 10 places in the past year. Here you can see some of the, the volatility uh, of, the, of the results. This is very much driven by uh, the mean temperature growth uh, in the country. And that has you know, caused this negative result. So I just also would like to say that if anybody would like to dig further into the results, you can clearly contact me after this webinar and I'd be happy to show you because we actually have a brand new dashboard where we can, you know, uh, it's very visual and it's very easy to dig in and see further why countries are performing well or not so well. When it comes to cities, we also have a top cities index. And uh, here is a, a screen grab from our dashboard focusing on the sustainability pillar. And at the top of the sustainable travel cities, we have Madrid, Seville and Stockholm. Stockholm, obviously not surprising that, uh, you know, Sweden is the number one in our sustainable travel index. But you know, for cities, we looked at over tourism. We looked at uh, the proportion of uh, residents to visitors. We you know looked at also the density of visitation and other such criteria. Madrid and Seville, we know that they're part of the the uh, carbon uh, net zero cities initiative in Europe. And the fact that, for example, in Madrid for you know, many, many years, they've been working with their telecoms players, uh, leveraging big data and using it to really improve uh, the sustainability and uh, you know, the well-being of their residents as well as their broader city infrastructure. Equally, you know, we know that uh, there is a great focus uh, on delivering sustainable cities across the whole of Europe uh, because we have such a high level of urbanization. Uh, you know, even in, in Spain, we have 80% of the population living in, in, in cities. So these areas really do need to, you know, walk the walk when it comes to sustainability. Here's just a case study on Amsterdam. We know that around the world, there are cities and destinations that are standing up and saying enough is enough. We need a quality driven uh, tourism model. And, you know, we know that there's this move to regenerative tourism and the fact that actually we shouldn't always be thinking or thinking at all about tourism through the lens of sheer visitor numbers. It's about quality, it's about the value that's derived to the residents and those local communities. 
some great sort of aspirations here. We know that Amsterdam has a very uh, organized approach to meeting those net zero targets, reducing emissions by 55% by 2030 in line with the Paris Agreement, and then by 95% by 2050. It's great to see the types of uh, technology that they're using in Amsterdam, AI, Internet of Things. And of course, we know there's such a big uh, sort of, so at, the, at the moment, a huge amount of interest and hype in areas such as artificial intelligence, generative AI. And of course, all these tools can be deployed for the benefits of destinations. Now we're going to sort of turn and look at each individual pillar in more detail and look at those destinations across Europe. So starting with the environmental sustainability pillar, as I mentioned, this accounts for 10% of the overall index. And the way that that is broken down is into these different areas. So climate, counting for 20%, which looks at the mean temperature growth in that country that they experience year on year. Then we have natural assets accounting for 20% of the environmental pillar. Here we focused on marine and terrestrial protected areas as a percentage of the overall country and the level of forest land in that country. We've got pollution accounting for 20% broken into CO2 emissions from uh, the use or, and consumption of fossil fuels, and then the level of PM10 pollution concentration. Equally, we have energy accounting for 20%. Here we've looked at the final consumption of energy, renewable energy capacity, and energy efficiency. For metrics such as this, obviously we're looking at those global sources as the International Energy Association. And then for water, this is the final sub-pillar accounting for 20%, we looked at water withdrawn as a percentage of renewables. So with this framework in mind, when we look at Europe, we see that Croatia is doing very, very well in this environmental sustainability pillar. It's ranked second uh, after Mozambique, and uh, when I dug into the results in more detail, uh, Croatia ranks very, very well or very highly for you know, its energy consumption. Uh, it's got low pollution levels and it has a strong focus on renewable energy. Cyprus has made strong uh, sort of uh, progress moving up 18 places to be ranked 38th in 2022. This was to do with uh, climate and mean temperature growth. And then we saw a big drop of 18 places for Spain over the past five years. As we, and this, when I dug into this, this was again to do with climate. As we know, certain countries in Europe this year have really suffered from the extreme heat. In Spain, we know that uh, desertification of the country continues to happen. And of course, this uh, creates more and more uh, extreme climatic events. So we are seeing this sort of having a knock-on effect on Spain's uh, position in the environmental sustainability. Very important to say, this is a kind of more indirect pillar to tourism, but it, it talks about the broader uh, environmental situation that countries are operating in. When it comes to, uh, you know, Croatia, as I said, they're doing very well, uh, you know, ranked second. Um, they have almost 29% of their energy comes from renewables. And of course, many travel and tourism businesses will be getting on board, uh, but that's, you know, 10% more than the, the average in Europe. They're benefiting from the level of forestation in the country and uh, you know, aims to phase out deforestation as well as phasing out coal by 2033. We also know that some destinations in Croatia have suffered with over-tourism in the past, 
but they have really turned that around. And, you know, we know that Dubrovnik have taken some bold steps, you know, to control and to really maximize the value that is left in those local communities. And of course, some really lovely de destinations and excuse my pronunciation, but the Plitvice Lakes just, you know, again, some of the great attractions that are on offer and the fact that they have their own mobile app to engage with visitors. Uh, this is a very important part of their cultural and natural assets that they are promoting. We also see the importance of social sustainability. This is the second pillar. I was very keen to include this in the index because we shouldn't just be looking at sustainability through the lens of climate. So this is how countries are performing when it comes to access to resources. So the level of the population with electricity, drinking water and improved sanitation. Food security, that accounts for a 15% of, of this, uh, this social sustainability pillar. This is where we look at the level of food imports. Of course, the more you import your food, the higher the carbon footprint there is. So we really want travel and tourism businesses as well as the broader economy to being more self-sufficient. Poverty, even in Europe, this is a very important subpillar. Those living below the poverty line, the Gini index, those are the key metrics we used. We also leverage the happiness, uh, World Happiness Report, so the index, the Global Peace Index, that's 15% uh, of, of this pillar, and then freedom, freedom in the world and the corruption index. And then finally, education. So looking at gender equality, the level of female students in higher education, the level of access to uh, education, especially secondary education. So that was 15% of this, of this pillar. So when we look at this pillar in more detail, the results are that we see Austria, Poland and Czech Republic ranked one, two and three. This is really great. And we know with the Green Deal, there is a very strong uh, framework in Europe for social sustainability. And it's really nice to see that that regulatory framework is translating into actual, you know, tangible results. So when it comes to Austria, they ranked particularly world in, well in the freedom in the world, access to resources. Uh, we saw Portugal making strong uh, improvements in its food security. Um, so again, you know, that really benefits the whole local uh, supply chain, which is obviously critical as well for travel and tourism. Georgia made uh, big strides in, the, in reducing poverty. So we saw that through the Gini End Index. Uh, actually for UK, they dropped because they saw an increase in poverty and also they saw a worse performance for uh, their ranking in the corruption index. And Turkey is actually at the bottom of the ranking of European countries. And we saw drops, for example, in happiness. So again, just the, you know, we know that the resident piece is increasingly important. So that's why, uh, you know, I was keen for us to inc incorporate this social element. This is a case study looking at Plantera, who are the, uh, the charity arm or philanthropic arm of G Adventures. Um, here they have a program in Naples with CASPA Social Cooperative, working with migrants. And this is just great about how to integrate, uh, you know, people who have uh, ha had to flee their country into the local destination and also to integrate with the residents. So we know that Planetara have a very strong global network and uh, yeah, it's just nice to see that um, they're taking uh, you know, 
uh, taking these challenges on, uh, such as this wave of migration that we continue to see from Africa and the Mid Middle East into Europe. So moving on to the third pillar, this is the economic sustainability pillar. Here we have allocated 30% to tourism dependency. So that's looking at the, the sheer level of uh, receipts and spending from domestic plus international tourism as a percentage of the, the GDP. And then we've got GVA from hotels and restaurants per capita of population. Debt, uh, this is uh, very important. And um, the Travel Foundation really you know, did a great job of shining a light on the invisible burden of tourism. And one of those areas is the level of debt that countries are running. Employment, here we focused on employment in hotels, restaurants, horeca, transport and uh, communications, and then the level of productivity in those sectors. And then 30% of the subpillar here is to do with digital and business readiness. So the level of the population with access to the internet and with access to a mobile phone. So this is the economic sustainability pillar. And I don't think you'll be surprised to see that Spain is uh, the number one country globally for uh, economic sustainability. Uh, it's done uh, very well in terms of digital readiness, uh, driving uh, the value of tourism to the economy. And um, equally, we have Switzerland that's moved up 13 places. This is uh, due to them driving strong rebound post-pandemic from domestic tourism. So we saw domestic plus international taking a larger share of GDP. And actually, it was the opposite for Finland. So they dropped 14 places because we saw a drop in the, the level of intensity of tourism spending and receipts in the country. And again, this could be to do with uh, the war in Ukraine having a knock-on impact on inbound tourism uh, from Russia. So that's economic sustainability. Just want to sort of focus a little bit on Spain as a case study. Um, you know, here we're comparing uh, this is a, a screen grab from the dashboard, so we can actually compare Sweden to Spain. As we saw, Spain is number one for economic sustainability. Comparing that to Sweden, it's ranked only 22nd. So in Spain, we know a very strong focus uh, from the government on travel and tourism. Um, already, they've recovered their pre-pandemic peak levels. Um, it's, it's sort of, they've got a very strong uh, framework for their sustainable tourism transformation uh, through their 2030 plan. Uh, it's sustainable, it's digital, and also full, focused on quality, diversification of source markets, and again, focusing on, you know, creating new segments within the tourism offer. So moving into inland tourism away from beach and sun. Obviously, there are challenges such as over tourism during the peak season. Uh, so they're working to mitigate that and equally looking at more high value long haul markets from North Asia, such as China. We've got the Middle East and the Americas. We know that new frameworks coming into place for the new visa waiver scheme uh, coming in next year. This will affect not just Spain, but all European markets. Um, so, yeah, that's maybe something that's going to impact a little bit negatively on travel facilitation. But then, you know, that visa waiver is valid for three years. And we move more to a US style uh, version of that. So now we are moving more into the direct tourism pillars. And I'm going to start here with sustainable tourism demand. So this accounts for 20% of the overall index. And the way we viewed this is resilience. And if we think about the 
the importance of domestic tourism and how it was a very important substitution and buffer during the pandemic. So here we've leveraged our Euromonitor data on domestic uh, trips per capita and the average spend per capita or per trip, I should say. Value creation, this is driving the importance of that quality tourism model, boosting the length of stay, looking at the average daily spend per arrival and taking a stab at tourism leakage. We have uh, a formula that we have uh, taken from the United Nations, breaking out if you're an advanced market versus a developing market, what's the expectation in terms of revenue flight and revenue leakage from your country. Over tourism, of course, this was the big topic pre-pandemic and now is coming back again as we see this roaring back of demand uh, from the recovery in tourism. So it's kind of a, an important challenge. Uh, here we've looked at these metrics of the population to tourism uh, ratio. We've looked at the density of the population and tourism. And we've also taken uh, into account the level or the dependency on cruise arrivals. Because as we know, uh, you know, with large cruise ships, this can be very challenging for destinations. But, you know, thinking down, you know, 10 years or more down the line, we know that there, there's a shift to more environmentally friendly ships. So there are changes as well happening in all of these areas. So when it comes to sustainable tourism demand, again, we see really nice performances by European countries. Iceland ranks second uh, following um, Australia. We have Norway fourth, Finland seventh, and, you know, when we look at uh, Iceland, we know that obviously when you think of Reykjavik to uh, and the residents there versus the, the sheer size of visitation, uh, that is a negative marker. But overall, uh, they're doing extremely well uh, in driving value. So they have, you know, a high average spend uh, per day. They are, you know, they're also seeing, you know, less leakage, which is great. We do, uh, we are seeing uh, Croatia moving up 13 places. They have been able to drive their daily spend and also improve the level of domestic tourism as well in terms of spending. And uh, what we're seeing for Denmark is that it's dropped uh, a, a couple, well, 18 places over the review period uh, this was very much because of a decline in the daily spend. Uh, they'd actually seen an increase in the length of stay, but the spending per day wasn't keeping up with the, you know, the, the, the more days that visitors are spending. So that's what's taken down Denmark's performance. Not to say that they're not performing well in other areas. Um, so when it comes to sustainable tourism demand, um, Rachel, I think we were going to stop here and maybe talk through uh, the results and the methodology a bit more, weren't we? Yes, absolutely, Caroline. Um, I'm blown away by the level of detail of, <laughs> of the study, really. Um, and I know we have more slides to come. I know we're going to cover the remaining pillars and also a bit about um, consumer attitudes to changing their behaviour and paying for these sorts of things. So we know that's all to come. But yes, absolutely. I thought it might be useful to take a pause and consider some of the things you've already covered. And we do have a, a flurry of questions from the audience as well. So perhaps now's the time to cover those before we move on to some, some even further, further detail. But I think one thing that struck me is exactly your point that um, it's possible to perform very well in certain areas uh, and not necessarily in others. And it's quite a challenge to perform across all of those in that very holistic way, isn't it, Caroline, you know, for, for destinations? Yes, and that's uh, the fact that we have seven pillars. Um, some of them are more indirectly linked to tourism, um, but we try to balance that out by the weightings that we gave the different pillars. So that's why we allocated more weighting to tourism demand, to lodging and transport. Um, but yes, I would say that 
we have this index and the, you, we saw the overarching results with Sweden number one, but actually every single metric, and we've got 56 metrics, can be viewed as a little index on its own. And so you can go in and you can cherry pick, for example, average daily spend. Uh, you can cherry pick, for example, energy usage, or for example, you know, uh, the level of CO2 emissions by air travelers. So actually you can, with the dashboard that we have, you can go in and really truly dig into the weeds, if you like, to find where you're performing well, um, where, if anything, it should be like a flag to, oh, maybe we didn't think of that. Maybe we should be looking at gender equality, access to education, et cetera, as part of our broader remit. Yes, th thanks, Caroline. And I think thinking about some of the the, um, the detail there of the the factors that are more outside of the control of a destination, if, if you like. I've got a question here uh, uh, from uh, somebody saying, um, there are so many external factors affecting the domestic mean temperature. And um, do you take that into account or is the account taken by lowering the weighting of that area? That, that was the question. Yes. And um, I, I can't remember exactly the the uh, allocation that we've given it. But yes, if and if anything, it's a very good point, because I do see that it can have this disruptive effect. But, you know, we did we have been seeing in Europe over the last couple of years, these extreme temperatures, and that's coming through in the annual average temperature, which, you know, it, and that's having this knock on effect on on some of the performance or the, the, the ranking performances. So, yes, there, there's always when you build an index, there's always something else that you can add in. Um, and, you know, it could be that, yeah, I can have that discussion about, well, maybe this one metric is having too much of a disruptive effect on the overall index. Um, because, as I say, we've built this, uh, we released it um, three years ago, and we're updating it annually. Uh, I already know some people are taking the index and feeding it into their own indices and own metrics layering in additional areas such as, uh, for example, human rights. Uh, I know a travel agent in Europe that are very keen and that's a very strong part of their ethical sort of messaging and positioning. So they have added in additional layers of detail, but yeah, absolutely. And, and very happy to take feedback on the index, ways we can improve it. And of course, as I say, it's about digging in and finding what works, what is working, and where do where is it more a red flag? And that's essentially also how I'm presenting this to our client base. So, you know, the hotels, the travel agents, uh, financial card players, it's like, well, how do we go and support these destinations in their broader level of sustainable transformation? Yes, thank you. And actually, we've got a couple of um, more practical questions uh, from uh, Vicky Smith and from Annette uh, London in, in the audience. Um, asking about the, the data timeframes, um, Annette did ask how often you update, but we've answered that's annually. Yeah. Um, but also, um, what is the time frame of, of the data? And following that, Vicky's question is, um, when you're talking about the temperatures, um, is that covering summer 23? As you know, obviously, we had a, some extreme heat, or will that be in the next index? Uh, great questions. It is annual data and it is updated um, by our analytics and economies and consumers team on a yearly basis. Uh, so that's why we're looking at 2022. Uh, we're, that's our latest year because we have full year data sets. Uh, that's correct that next year's edition will have the impact of the heat waves and those annual average temperature changes that you know we've seen this year. Um, so yes, it's it's annual um, and those sources are, we have like, I can actually um, share uh, as well with you, Rachel, so that you can feed on to the, the attendees today about uh, the sources that we're using. So it's World Bank, it's, you know, as I say, the International Energy Association, it's 
uh, you know, and then obviously we leverage our own proprietary data as well. So on de domestic tourism, on lodging, and actually we've not quite come to the lodging pillar, but we partner with Greenview, who are obviously very well known and respected in environmental metrics for lodging and uh, hotels. Oh, lovely. Thank you. I think perhaps just one more more point before we, we do move on to lodging and, and transport, which I know is, is to come, is um, this question, obviously, Europe and European destinations are performing fantastically on, you know, when you look at on the holistic measures. Just wondering if there's any insight as to why that is and if that is likely to be a trend you're going to see in your indices in the future. Well, just um, from the various different types of research we have at Euromonitor. So obviously, as part of the Sustainable Travel Index, uh, in the, there is a corresponding report. And there I review in more detail what's behind it. And I think absolutely fundamental to Europe's success is the Green Deal. And, you know, that's where it's great to see the, the legislation, the regulation in place, and actually trickling down and having tangible results on European countries. Um, equally, I know from our consumer survey research that European consumers are more engaged with uh, sustainability. They're much more aware of it, especially when you compare it to North Americans. Uh, but then you also see emerging markets, Latin America, Asia Pacific, again, still very interested and concerned ab about climate change and how they can have a positive impact. So I'm seeing it from the consumer side, I'm seeing it from the regulatory side, and then also from the travel business side. So we have a voice of industry survey. We ask, how engaged are you with the sustainable development goals? What are you focusing on? What are your environmental and uh, social priorities? And there, you know, in the just thinking of last year's results, because we're transitioning to a new uh, survey at the moment, uh, you know, Europe stands ahead of the pack in terms of engagement with SDGs, with measuring, monitoring. Um, so it, I feel that Europe has the full package. It's coming in in, in various different, uh, in that paradigm, it's got the right mix of interest from consumers, from businesses and government. Understood. Thank you. Um, actually, Caroline, one question has just come in on sustainable tourism demand. So we'll, we'll perhaps take that before we, we move on. It was around the um, the cruise dependency uh, mm -hmm. metric. Uh, uh, somebody asking whether that is um, ocean cruise or does it include river cruise? Obviously, with river cruise ships being substantially smaller and some destinations kind of relying on, on the river cruise cruise market uh, for their tourism. And um, it was just a question, really, whether whether it was all types or whether it was just ocean. It is. It's all types because um, it's part of our travel and tourism system. Um, so we take that data um, from the UNWTO and then we update it and, you know, clean it and uh, so definitely it's all water uh, arrivals. Great, thank you. Um, I think perhaps if, if you're ready, Caroline, shall we shall we move on to the, the final pillars um, and then we can take some, some more questions if we have time? Yeah, definitely. So, um, so moving into sustainable transport. Uh, so this is a 20% weighting of the overall index. It's divided into air travel with 25%. So looking at the dependency on air arrivals as a percentage of, of the total, and then also the level of uh, domestic air. So obviously the higher you have the, the in the ranking, the higher the dependency, the, the worse the ranking is, if you like. Um, however, for rail, the higher you have, uh, you know, the, the more length of public railway you have, the, the more positive that is for your score. And then we've got alternative modes, so possession of bicycles, uh, passenger car registrations. Um, we've got infrastructure, which is a 15% weighting, um, looking at, at uh, the quality of transport infrastructure. And then we've got the density of road networks. And finally, with a very um, uh, sort of high score there, we've got 25% on emissions. So the level of emissions from transport in general, and then the level of emissions by air passengers at KM. 
So when we look at the results, again, Europe uh, performs extremely well at the top globally. We see um, Hungary, Slovakia and Austria as the leading countries. Um, we know that there's a very, a very impressive um, sort of uh, initiatives in place, regulation in place. We've got the Trans European Transport Network. We've got new corridors being invested in. Uh, that's why we see these benefits trickling down to countries like Hungary, uh, Austria. Um, so Hungary ranked very well in terms of its level of rail network. Uh, it had, you know, good level of uh, road density and also benefited from a very high possession of bicycles, which was nice to see. Um, then with Italy, they moved up 13 places uh, to 28 uh, in 2022. This was because of less dependency on air a travel for domestic travel. And so obviously we know that there's been some flashpoints, uh, particularly in Sicily, Sardinia, with the, you know, the government even threatening to impose these uh, air caps on pricing. So actually it's also having an impact on the level of people who are using domestic air travel. Then um, Latvia actually saw a drop there. Uh, this was due, due to rising uh, CO2 emissions for transport. So that's what's dragged its score down. There, I, I find that there was lots of interesting examples uh, and case studies taking place in terms of transport across Europe. So Heart Aerospace in Scandinavia, their Swedish startup, looking to electrify um, regional transportation. So regional flights with its electric aircraft. Obviously we know there are limitations to these types of uh, aircraft, but you know, it's definitely an alternative for short haul hops. And you know, they're using these case studies um, as the, again, apologies for uh, my pronunciation, but the Island Islands, and you know, it's it's interesting to see that they could take potentially carry up to thirty passengers um, for two hundred kilometers. And I just think I'm based in Scotland. You know, this would just be great to see happening in the north of Scotland with electric aircraft. And I know that they've already tried and tested uh, some some electric flights here. We've also got um, airports, the need to, you know, the, the Airport Council International has set uh, a deadline of 2050 for decarbonizing. Uh, the Schiphol plans were really fascinating to look at, uh, embracing sustainability, digitalization, uh, equally the fact that they need to transition to sustainable aviation fuel, which we know is going to be very, very hard but needs a lot of investment and support from government. Uh, when we're looking at the future of, of airports, it's all about self-driving cars, uh, you know, drones, even a potential hyperloop, uh, you know, that they're planning in Schiphol. Oh, we skipped. And then Norway, again, sort of transitioning to clean energy with the use of hydrogen, uh, so it's it's a very fascinating area, um, but obviously, as we can see um, that there is political influence on this as well. It can work either way. And we know that certain countries are feeling uh, the heat from elections coming up in the next couple of years, which has sort of led governments and, uh, you know, um, parties to roll back on certain commitments that they may have made. So I'm just going to go into the final pillar, which is sustainable lodging. So 20% of the overall index, uh, we leverage our proprietary data on lodging uh, that accounts for 30% of this pillar, short-term rentals as a percentage of overall lodging sales. Here we took the balance. So we didn't want to say the more short-term rentals, the better, but if you have a balanced view of supply, and again, the same with hotel sales, a balanced view of hotels and not one uh, format dominating the other. 
And then here we have resource usage in hotels. Uh, this is the data taken uh, and shared by Greenview, a great partner, looking at hotel energy usage per square meter, hotel water usage per occupied room in liters, and then the overall hotel carbon footprint. And actually, you know, it's, it's great to have this type of data available. It's in the Cornell Hotel Benchmarking Tool, and I'm sure many of you are, are working with Greenview as well. When it comes to the results, this is where we see Denmark as the global leader, uh, ranked number one. They have um, done a really impressive job. Uh, you know, their level of um, energy use per square meter has dropped by 73% over the past five years. They've done an 80% reduction in their carbon footprint. And um, yeah, very good balance in their hotel versus short-term rental supply. Um, Romania, again, uh, we mentioned them at the beginning, but they, they saw their energy use drop 55%. And uh, you know that's very impressive. Hungary, actually, on the other hand, has uh, dropped in its, its ranking because it's seen an, a 54% increase in its uh, water use and an 88% increase in its energy use. So it's very interesting to see some countries really doubling down on this and then others just sort of rolling back. And then I just wanted to uh, showcase Iberostar. As we know, they are global leader in sustainability uh, they launched their first fully 100% electric hotel in Spain this year. And also the fact that they're looking at not just scope one and two emissions and reducing them by 85%, but also tackling the very difficult scope three. So just before uh, we wrap up and go to the Q&A, um, I have some final sort of uh, insights I'd like to share with you. And essentially, it's about consumers, because ultimately, you know, they're the ones that are struggling with the cost of living crisis. They're the ones that are having to reprioritize their budgets at the moment. But from our lifestyle survey data, we continue to see this high level of engagement with you know, the climate change. So 60% saying they want to have a positive impact on the environment during, uh, you know, throughout their daily lives. Of course, that includes travel. And of course, you know, being very concerned about climate change overall. We then also have some of the key source markets into Europe. And here I've selected the more sustainable types of travel features that you can have. So that's ecotourism, it's arts and culture, immersion in local culture, it's nature, outdoors, sports, adventure. And it was really interesting to see that actually China was the top country for choosing more sustainable types of travel. So we shouldn't also exclude other you know, markets or countries around the world and think that only you know, it's a Europe-centric uh, concern. It's actually across the board. Um, as I mentioned, less interest from the North Americans, but you know that is ultimately that will increase uh, as we move you know through uh, the next decade. And of course, this very important question, Rachel, that we were discussing, just how how willing are consumers uh, to pay for more sustainable types of travel? And so, Again, focusing in on the more sustainable travel features we have in our survey data, I could see that the majority uh, would pay more. So it's almost 80% of those that selected nature, outdoors, sports adventure, immersion in local culture or ecotourism would actually pay over 10% more. And we even see that some will pay up to even more than 50%. So we shouldn't shy away from the sustainable travel options. Uh, consumers are really on board with this. And I think this, for me, was very interesting and 
quite surprising results that even in the cost of living crisis, there is willingness out there. So just to you know, wrap up for today, we've gone through the results of the Sustainable Travel Index. The index is a tool to, and it should be used uh, you know, along with other tools that are out there. There is room for improvement, but the way that we're using it uh, with our clients and our partners is to highlight success and to flag areas for improvement to help destinations on their overall you know, transformation to a more sustainable and fair and resilient type of tourism. Obviously, it's about focusing on critical areas. We have 56 metrics, we have 99 countries, you know, many of them in Europe. So you are able to drill down and highlight exactly where you're doing well and where you're not doing so well. And then of course, as I mentioned, this paradigm that we have in Europe is really in balance. We have consumers on board, despite the cost of living. We have governments, maybe a little bit sort of tentative at the moment, but still those long-term goals are in on their horizon and need to be met, of course. And then businesses as well, post-pandemic, very vibrant, very resilient, and really doubling down on that sustainable trans uh, transformation. And of course, um, it's been a great pleasure to present the results. And of course, I'm more than happy to talk methodology or you know, to go into the data in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, so much detail on there. And I can see you've put your contact details up there, uh, yeah. presumably because you're happy for people to contact you yeah. if they have specific questions. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, just before we wrap up then, um, a couple of questions um, from the audience and definitely something on my mind uh, as well is wondering whether you have any plans at Euromonitor to uh, go on to track um, what people say they're willing to pay for these features versus what they actually go and do. Because I know certainly for some of our audience, it's a real challenge for product development because you get this data that people are willing to pay for something but when it comes to booking, they forgot they said that. Um, and we just, we, it would be really interesting if we were ever able to get to a place where we could then go and see what these people do. Um, so just a couple of questions really from the audience were, were, do you have plans for that? Or would there ever be a way of us being able to do that, do you think? Um, I, obviously we have a very uh, talented uh, team that do, that run our, our consumer surveys. And every year they are very uh, receptive to new ideas. So at the, you know, today I presented the, the new results that we have in terms of willingness to pay, but we can equally add in additional questions to, as you say, at the time of booking, did you pay more? So yes, there's different ways that we can word it. I, I would say, you know, I guess it's also looking at the, the survey questions in more detail and then just tweaking it so that it can be sharper. And, and as you say, highlighting, well, you would like to pay more or did you pay more? So yeah, there's a, a little bit of a nuance there. Um, but yeah, as I say, we have this consumer surveys um, where we talk to 40,000 consumers around the world in 40 countries. And then we have the voice of industry, which is where we go out and we speak to our client base across multiple industries, including travel, tourism, and hospitality. Um, and yeah, we're waiting for the results on that because that's all about what are your strategic priorities? Are you investing in AI? Are you investing in you know, internet of things, big data, et cetera, et cetera. So again, that, that could be you know, a future webinar that we can run with ETOA to maybe look at those business and investment priorities uh, that uh, people are saying are really important to them. Absolutely. And um, we are almost on the hour, Caroline. I've got one last question, which I think is uh, perhaps a, a, a useful one to finish on. Um, it was about uh, how countries could use the Sustainable Travel Index. Obviously, we've seen an awful lot of information. I'm um, just wondering if, if in a nutshell, you can tell us how, what people are doing with it to improve their sustainable offer and, and perhaps their ranking as well? Yes, we get asked a lot, um, you know, 
What is the strategy to improve our performance? And of course, you know, as, as we stated at the beginning, it's a very holistic sort of area. So you do need to sort of, first of all, do that deeper dive into the index and then draw out the success stories and then those areas for improvement. And then of course, there's the whole, you know, who do you work with? What are the, and that's what I, I aim to do in the actual report itself is to say, well, the World Travel and Tourism Council have released their hotel basics. You know, that's one way to improve your uh, lodging metrics in sustainability. Uh, the Travel Foundation have launched the, you know, the latest Envision report. So, you know, for us, it's also about being part of the discussion. Uh, but obviously, at your own, we have a consulting team, uh, including myself, who build tourism strategies for destinations, for travel brands. And of course, you know, as I say, the index is interesting in itself, but it's part of that broader strategic piece. Indeed. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so much food for thought. Um, really appreciate you coming on to share your insights. Um, as I mentioned, Caroline's presentation will be available very soon. We'll email it to you. It's also going to be on our Insight Hub along with the, this recording, uh, which is itoa.org slash insight. Um, if you haven't been to the Insight Hub, do please take a look. There are a wide range of reports and opinion pieces and research on there. Um, it's all summarised for you if you don't have enough time to read the full reports. Um, and it's all by category. Um, Euromonitor, as a partner of ours, do have their own channel on the Insight Hub. So if you're looking specifically for Euromonitor's research, you can search under the Euromonitor channel. Um, we just put something new up there yesterday, which is um, a blog piece about the effect of the Paris Olympics, if you're interested in um, events uh, and event tourism. So um, do please take a look at that. Um, and with that, I say thank you very much for joining us today, Caroline, and um, I wish you all a, a pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you for having me.